While we remain standing, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. First Corinthians chapter number six. Once you've located First Corinthians and chapter number six, find verse number nine and we'll begin reading there. I will read out loud. You read along with me silently, as is our custom here, and then uh, we'll read this together. First Corinthians, <coughs> excuse me, chapter number six, starting in verse number nine. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of heaven, uh, sorry, the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed. Socks, it's washed, not washed. But ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Father, thank you for the Bible. Let me, for your sake, encourage the people this morning. If there's one person here, perhaps they're trying desperately to live in such a way that God may accept them. May they understand that is, that'll never work. It'll never happen. For God is pleased with one person, and that is Jesus Christ. However, if we would find ourselves in him through repentance of our sin and accepting him as Savior, then God will accept us. There is no other way. Father, I pray that this morning we'll realize those who think they are really, really, really living pretty decent and don't need to be saved, and those who believe God will never save a person like me, may they both listen this morning that it will sink deep into their hearts. May they understand the gospel. Thank you for the Bible. Help me to help your people. Well, thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So many souls have tested him throughout the course of time. So many still reach out to him with broken hearts and minds. And every one of them will say, with no exception that they find, that Jesus never fails. Even in the days of old, he brought his people through and then he came to show his love when he died for me and you and then he rose again to prove that every story had been true that jesus never fails jesus Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. You might as well get thee behind me, Satan. You cannot prevail because Jesus never fails. Sometimes this world brings troubles that I find so hard to bear. I know I could not make it without Jesus being there. It's so encouraging to know, however deeper in despair, that Jesus never fails. So what can I do to prove to you? Tell me, how can you deny 
No untold facts, no mysteries, it's all so cut and dry. On the witness stand of your life, I'll be the first to testify that Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. You might as well get the Behind me, Satan, you cannot prevail because Jesus never fails. You might as well get thee behind me, Satan, you cannot prevail because Jesus never fails. Because Jesus never fails. First Corinthians chapter number six. When we were in the storefront, which were over off of um, West Broad Street, uh, next to Sheddinger, right across from their parking lot there, uh, we were out soul winning one day. I was, and I ran into. I want you to listen very carefully to me, okay? I ran into a. Um, it was a house. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure what the street was, but it was a side street, and then there was across from a uh, carryout, uh, there was a house there, and there were some people that lived there, and I knocked on the door and started talking to uh, this young lady. She was about 15 years old, and yet the facial features and her body would tell you she was much, much older, but she wasn't. She was 15 years old. However, in her eyes, which is hard to cover up what really goes on in a person's life in the eyes. And I looked at her and you could, there was a very recognizable emptiness in her life. After a long talk, she did receive Jesus Christ. We had prayer, talked with her for a long, long time. We did have prayer. She accepted Christ as Savior. And she came to church. Uh, we were in the storefront at the time, uh, the little storefront, I think. At, no, it was the larger storefront. And she came there. And um, when she was there, uh, it wasn't that our people were unfriendly or did not uh, reach out to her. I believe it was on a Thursday night, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, it seemed, she just seemed out of place, you know. Um, like she was glad she was there, but out of place. Nothing was familiar to her at all. And it wasn't that our people, as I said, were not friendly or went out of their way to say hi to her. They really did. It just seemed like, I don't belong here. That kind of a thing. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, on one Sunday morning, <clears throat> my daughter and I, going out to pick up all of our uh, possible uh, folks that were supposed to come to church, all of our prospects that morning, stopped by the house, uh, that I had met her. We actually we were sitting on the porch when I was talking to her, and I knocked on the door, and uh, nobody answered. And so you know how you do. You knock again a little louder, and nobody answered. And I thought, oh, man, how disappointing is that? I had spent time with her. She had come to church several times, and now it's Sunday morning, and I want her to come back because you can't really grow the way you're supposed to if you're not in church. And so I went to go get her, glad to pick her up. My daughter was with me, and uh, nobody answered the door. As I turned to walk away, I happened to notice out by the curb in front of the house there was a station wagon, and I thought I saw some movement in there. And I looked, and next thing I know, the doors opened up and the tailgate opened up, and three men got out and two girls. One of the girls was the girl that I had been working with. 
trying to get her into church and get her away from everything. We come to find out that I encouraged her. I said, look here, okay, we got to hurry, but I'll wait. Now, you need to go inside and get ready, and uh, we'll go to church this morning. I said, besides that, you shouldn't be, I don't know what was going on. You shouldn't be in a situation like that. Young ladies don't act like that. And so she just stood there. Now, out of the corner of my eye, I saw somebody get out of a car and start walking towards me. It was a man, and he said, uh, who are you? I said, I'm Pastor Bell. I come here to take her to church. She's not going to church with you. I said, yeah, if she wants to go to church, she can go to church with me. She said, no, she's not going to church. She belongs to me. I said, she don't belong to you. She belongs to me, and it's best that you leave right now. She looked at me, and she looked at me very, very discouraged, very sad, and said, probably best you leave. See, he was using her to make money off of men for him. You say, well, Pastor, those kinds of people, I mean, really, they don't have much of a future anyway. God can't really use anybody like that. I mean, come on. There's got to be something there to work with uh, before you get started. Hmm. I know a man, that uh, good guy, too, hard worker, when he's working. And uh, he used to, I uh, want to be careful what I say, because some of you love it, key, I don't know what, who I'm talking about. But had a, really had a pretty decent job, made good money. A good guy, too. Seriously, a good guy. Father had, I think, three or four kids. And uh, when, when, when he was where he was supposed to be, a good worker. Um, good dad, good husband, when he wasn't out smoking crack somewhere. Put your phone away, please. Look up here. Okay, you're here to look at and listen to me, not on your phone, please. Thank you. Listen to me very carefully. When he does this, he will take grocery money, school money, bill money, borrow money, anything he has to. And he will spend hundreds of dollars, hundreds and hundreds of dollars buying all the crack he can. He will go get one of the cheapest hotels he can find, rent all the pornography that he can afford, and he'll be gone four or five days at a time. He said, Preacher, God, God can't use people like that. There's just no way. Uh, I thought you said this man was saved. And, uh, and if he really is saved, God, God, just, I mean, God can't use a person like that. I have a question for you. Listen very carefully. I told you at the beginning of this, we, and in Sunday school I did the same thing. We tend to believe that we are either good enough or so good that I don't understand why I need to come to Christ to be saved. Or we are so bad and in the gutter and hopeless that there's no sense getting saved. Now, I don't care what level you think you're on. I'm going to tell you something right now. Jesus come to die for the whole world. And I don't care who you are or what you've been involved in. I don't care how good you think you are. Jesus died for you. And if Jesus died for you, you have to be saved. If he died for you, there's a reason he died for you. And it's not because you can make it there on your own. He died for you because you don't stand a snowball's chance if you do not get saved. You understand me? So what happens here? Would, would God use a man who was ever filled with demons? I mean, does God, can God use a person like that? Let's think about that. Filled with, no, he didn't have a bad attitude. I mean, he's filled with demons. Can God use somebody like that? Can God use a woman that has been married five times and living with a person? Can God use a person like that? I mean, just think about it. We're talking about on bottom level, okay? We're talking about down, and I know most of us are way, way above. I got that part. But now we're talking about this level down here right now. Can God use a crook who steals money from other people? uses his business and authority to put them into a position to where they have to give in to him, and then he uses the law against them so that he can become richer? Can God, can, is it possible that God could use somebody like that? Is that possible? Is it possible that there's a man, rough, cussing, not, probably not many manners, no religious background whatsoever, Man in the middle of his life, 40s, 50s, maybe even early 60s, is it possible that a man that's been that way all of his life, that God could possibly use a person like that? I mean, we're talking gutter people, right? We're talking about people way down here, right? I was talking to Deidre and Shannon this morning. 
Was it this week somebody died, or you were telling them about a friend of yours? It, it, was, it was my cousin that got killed years ago. Yeah, okay, years ago. And they're talking to these younger guys here, and they used to be caught up in that. Mm-hmm. And they thought that's what life was all about. Mm-hmm. And most of us, many of us did that. We ran the streets. Now, those of you that never did this, I understand this is hard for you to imagine. I got it. And I'm glad that you were raised with some morals and some good habits. I'm glad for you. Honestly, I'm, I am. But you have a different kind of problem sometimes. You don't understand why you should have to be saved. Those of us that grew up that way and out in the streets where some of our friends died in the streets and whatever else, we don't think we could be saved. I mean, we're just too bad to be saved. And this is what the devil tries to do all the time. Suppose that God could save a man or use a man, use a man that cussed all the time and, and, and just business was all he cared about and is rough and no religious background. Can God use a man who murders Christians? Could God use a man that at one time murdered Christians? Could, he, could God do that? You think God cares about those kinds of people that he would actually save them even though this man murdered Christians before he got saved? Is that possible? Could God do this? What about a blasphemer? Someone who blasphemes God. By the way, just saying God whatever is not the only way to blaspheme God. A lot of people think it is, only in cussing. That's not true. Can God use a person like that? How about an idol worshiper? You got a little Buddha at home, do you? Got a picture of Mary on the wall that you pray to? You got a cross that you do this all the time to and hoping that somehow it will help you? Is that what you do? Can God use a person like that? How about a thief? Can God use a thief? Listen to me. Can God use it? I'm just asking you a question. I'm trying to hit all these bases to get you to understand what we think sometimes as worthless and cannot be helped and it doesn't really matter and what's going on in their life. is It'll never amount to anything anyway. Is it possible for these people to be used of God? How about an agnostic? How about a person who simply says, I don't believe in God whatsoever? Make a difference to me. Can God possibly use a person who's like, how about a drunkard? How about a dope addict? Can God use people like that? Is it, I'm just asking, I'm trying to bring you down to thinking about other people. This girl that I brought to church, I don't know what happened to her after that. Have no idea. Never seen her again. I just know that this guy was pimping her out that much I knew. I wasn't about ready to leave that morning until she told me, you need to leave. I wasn't so much worried about him. I was worried about her. I don't know what happened after that. By the way, the man who would take money from his family and run off and smoke crack, he'd do this once or twice every year, just gone for almost a whole week. He's a nice guy too, really was a nice guy. Said he was a born-again Christian. We almost believe that Christians cannot, once they're saved, get back into the depths of sin. Yes, you can. Now, I know most of you in here, you, you don't even, you've never crossed your eyes. You, 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 you've never had a bad, th- I understand that. And I also understand you lie a lot. But the fact of the matter is, can God use people like that? Throughout the Word of God, what I just described to you are the kinds of people that God calls to Himself. God said, I need you. And I need you. Now, I'm just pointing. So if you think, what does he know? He needs you. Oh, no, not me. Listen to me very carefully. If God didn't call people like I just talked about, God would have nobody to use. Now, you look at me and you listen to me well. Quit thinking that you're so good. You don't understand this whole religious stuff. You are a wicked sinner. You're guilty of murder. Now, just just face the facts. If Jesus died for you, he died because of you. Therefore, an innocent man died because of your sins. That's pretty bad. Here's what you have to understand. I want you to notice down in verse number 11, chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 11. Look down there where it says this. Now, all of these people here, look, look at chapter number 6. Look at verse number 10. Uh, go to verse number 9. Okay, let's just start 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit... See, no, preacher, I'm not this way at all. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators. 
nor idolaters, nor adulterers, two different types of people, nor effeminate, that is a girlish acting soft man. Though that is the person one step away from being a homosexual. Men are not supposed to be soft, girlish acting. You you understand me? It's not something Baptist made up. It's right here in the Bible. Look up the word effeminate and you'll figure it out. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's really bad. Nor thieves, nor covetous. So you're nothing, you're none of those in nine. How how about covetous? I know you're not a drunkard, but you drink all the time. Nor uh, revilers, extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Ready? Ready? And such were some of you. Now, he's not just talking about those who were present in that day. He's talking about this crowd here. And such were some of you. Now, some of you, I know your background. You have told me, preach, I used to do this and I used to do that and God saved me from this. And and I understand that. And so the Bible is saying some of you were these things. These things that you would say, I'm not that, I'm not that, I've never been that, I'll never be that, I'm not this, I'm not that. And then Paul comes along and says, and such were some of you. You used to be this way. You know that person when you're driving down the street now you see standing on the corner bumming? There are people in this room, you would never guess, that did that one day in their life. There are people here that did despicable things that you would never even suggest or think about. I'm not saying you have to to be saved. I'm just saying quit looking down at this 15-year-old girl and saying God could never use someone like that. She gave her life to Christ, and only God knows when she gets to heaven. She's a born-again Christian and has never done one thing in her life for Christ. You better be glad God called it eternal security. You need to lift up your head, my friend, whoever you are in here. No matter how you think about yourself. I can't believe how teenagers and young adults, you live in America with everything that goes on here and all the possibilities. You are so close to being depressed and suicide all the time. I don't understand. I do not understand it. I have a lot going on this noggin. A lot. And I'm telling you right now, there is no way I would destroy this. Are you kidding me? No. There's no way in the world. You get that way because you think too much of yourself. You will not allow God and the way he said to handle things. You will not give yourself to him. So you're just handling things all by yourself. I'm just saying, I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care who you run with. I don't care what you have been guilty of or even now are guilty of. I want you to understand something. All those people I just mentioned are biblical people that God used in a great way. God used in a great way. So while you're sitting there feeling sorry for yourself or so depressed, yeah, I couldn't be a Christian. You could be saved. Let's just start right there. You know Jesus died for sinners, not for good people. You know that. So you fit. You fit right in there. These people God calls to himself. God, don't give up on yourself. God didn't give up on you. See, you you think, why would God want me? Quit, Quit thinking for God. God died for you. God loves you. God wants you to be one of his children. God doesn't just want to save you from hell. God made mankind to fellowship with. God wants to spend time with you, not just save you from hell, not just get you to heaven. He also wants to spend time with you. But the devil in our own flesh keeps bringing up our path. You're not worthy and you can't do this. You'll never amount to anything. I'm going to tell you something right now. You get saved, give your life to Christ. Everybody I just mentioned, the extortioner and the cussing person, the woman married five times, the man filled with demons, the person who murdered Christians, all of these people use greatly of God, which I'm sure at one time they thought that will never happen. As long as God is on the throne, and he is, and you're still alive. God wants to use you. He wants to. It's not that you can't be used. You don't think you can be. But God is trying to call you even now. Throughout the word of God, these types of people are the kind of people that God called. Example, go, go to 1 Samuel, way back in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel. I'm going to show you something here. <laughs> it's an amazing story. King David did not start off uh, necessarily uh, once he got into leadership real great. Uh, and you wouldn't believe the kinds of people that he attracted. 
It's kind of like me and Anchor Baptist Church. Watch what happens here. In 1 Samuel chapter number 22, 1 Samuel chapter number 22, listen, look, read verse number 1 and verse number 2. Now, David's on the run. Uh, he didn't do anything wrong. Uh, Saul's got it in for him, and he doesn't want to fight his friend and his king, so he's going to take off and go somewhere. And he finds this place to hide called the Cave Adullam. While he's there, watch the kind of people that join up with... Da- it sounds like anchor. Watch here. David, therefore, departed... Verse 1, departed therefore, uh, departed thence and escaped to the Cave Adullam. And when, uh, and when his brethren and all his family's house heard of it, they went thither to him. We're ready? Watch this. And everyone that was distressed, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, yeah, that's the crowd I need. (laughs) But watch what he said. Gathered themselves to him and became a captain over them. He became a captain over them. And there and there were with him about 400 men. All these people in debt, they're depressed, they're discouraged, uh, they just lost everything. I mean, things are pretty bad. And you said, Preacher, why does God send us these types of people? You know, I used to, hey, God, if I could just have one or two millionaires, just one or two, I get some things done. You know what I get? People in debt. People that think life's just about done, that I'll never amount to anything. And you almost have to build them up and teach them things from nothing. But watch this, watch this, watch this. These people here, you do understand, when you read, these are called David's mighty men. David's mighty men, there were about 39 of them, so not all these people were this way. A lot of them were just everyday people who said, David's our king and we're going to go after him. But all these people, understand, they fought great wars for God. They fought in great wars for God. You understand this? They were used of God to fight great wars for God. The, these, these people, these, everyone in distress and everyone in debt and everyone discontented. How would you like to try to organize that crowd? So we come to find out these people build a great kingdom for God. These same people help build a great kingdom for God. What is your excuse? What makes you think God can't use you? I'll tell you, the only person God can't use is the person that will not let God use them. These discontented, distressed, in debt people, God wrote about them. And how they were used. If God was to write another Bible, what would your story be like? What would would God put in here? You ever think about that? I've thought about that. Now, God will never write another Bible. And all the people who are writing new Bibles, that's not of God either. So go to Jeremiah chapter number 18. Okay? Middle of your Bible be Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah. You got it? Jeremiah chapter number 18. We have a prophet here that's going down to a literal potter. A guy works on a a wheel with clay, that kind of stuff, you know. And in Jeremiah chapter number 18, look what it says starting in verse number 1. And the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house. Not the potter's house. The potter's house. One's a real potter's house and the other one's fake. Now... Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. He said, I'm going to teach you something. You go down there, I'm going to show you something, I'm going to teach you something. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he, the potter, wrought a work on the wheels. You know how they do that, right? In the old days, they had a wheel that that laid out flat this way, and then they also had a wheel down here that they would spin with their foot all the time. Okay, sorry, you can't see me. They would do like this, okay? They do this while they're working with things up here. You understand? This wheel was connected to hip bone, connected to the ankle bone. You got it. Okay, yeah. And so I don't think that's really the way it works. And so he went down there and he said, go down there. I want to show you something. I'm going to teach you something from that guy working with clay on that wheel. Here's what he's going to show him. Watch what happened. Verse number two. And I went down to the potter's house. Good thing you obeyed. And behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. Verse four. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Well, throw it away. Done there, buddy. Never amount to anything from now on. I mean, if if, if it's got a a flaw in it, I mean, what good is it? Hold it. So he made it again. Thank the Lord. He made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. 
Now the Lord here is talking about Israel, but the application can apply to us. When you first get saved, you want to do everything perfect. Amen? Amen. You really do. I remember standing up in a church service one time. My brother was preaching a revival. And in those churches, they used to say, does anybody have a testimony before we leave? We'll never do that here. I'm just saying we did that there. And I raised up my hand. He goes, yes. And I said, I mean, my heart was touched, man. And I said, I want everybody to know I will never sin or let the Lord down in my whole life. Good intention, right? But not according to knowledge, right? And so I met every bit of it. Now, can you can imagine how discouraged I became when it finally dawned on me, you messed up royally. Because I wanted to do, I, I wanted to be the vessel that was made right. And while it was being made, while the, while the potter was working on me, there was a flaw, a problem, a hole, a gouge. A scar, something. But he didn't throw me away. Do you know what he did? The clay just yields and the potter continues to work to make it another vessel. My dear friend, whether you're unsaved right now and need to be saved, God can use you. And if you're saved and you have blown it, I mean you sinned, you pulled it. Stupid mistake. You did something you know full well. You hope nobody... I want you to understand something. A lot of people may not understand that. God does. And God is not through working on you. He will work on you again if you'll let Him do that. And so in Jeremiah chapter 2, He said the vessel that He made of clay was marred. It was, no, wait a minute. You're the potter. You're making this. I know. And right there's a spot that's, that's bad. It's just bad. So what does he do in the hand? In the hand of, so he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter. You may not be able to fulfill everything you had in mind when you were desiring to perfectly live for God. Right, right. But he already knew that, and he wants to use you. Why does God... By the way, it doesn't tell us what was wrong with the vessel. It doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us a hole, a gouge, a scratch, a piece of foreign matter in there. Why? That's not what's important. You know what's important? It's not what was wrong. What's important is that the potter begin his work again. Would you understand? It's not I'm perfect or I'm worthless. You're not perfect. You'll never be perfect. You'll never be absolutely pure and clean until the rapture takes place and you get your new body. Never going to happen. We actually set ourselves up for some failure. Preacher, I'm going to do everything. I will never sin. I will never let the Lord down. I don't have to break news to you. I have over and over and over and over again. You say, what does Jesus think about that? He doesn't want me to. He's not for it. But he's for me. He loves me. I want you to understand something here. Don't believe the devil and his crowd. If God didn't call, look, look, folks, if God didn't call the halt and the blind and the maim and the disbeliever and, and the person who is a thief and the person who kills, if he didn't call, if he didn't call the, he'd have nobody to work with. Everybody in this room fits into those verses. I don't care what level you are on. Please understand, God does not ignore sin. God forgives sin and chastises those that are in sin. Do you understand me? Nobody gets by with sin. That's not the point. So he didn't tell us what was wrong with the vessel. He simply said, there's this problem, and I fixed it. I'll make it again. I'll make it a usable vessel, and this is what God does. Why does God choose this way? Why doesn't God go after some of you perfect folks? Why doesn't God say, now there's a vessel worthy of my, of my attention? Why doesn't he do that? That would make sense to me. The Bible said, scarcely for a good man, some would dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why would he do that? Why not go after some good people, some nice people, some mature people, some people that don't have problems? Because they don't think they need to be saved. And God would get no glory out of that. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Preacher, where do you come up with all this stuff? It's, it's, a, it's a book I was given one time called the Bible. I really do try not to make this stuff up. I know some preachers make stuff up as they go. I try not to do that. 
1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Drop down to verse number 26. Why, why does God call a Apostle Paul who murdered Christians? Why would he call a, a Peter, Simon, who was a fisherman, rough as all get out, cuss, impetuous, at, at times lose his temper, always sticking his foot in his mouth. I mean, come on, God can't use a guy who keeps doing that all the time. He did. Yep, yep, right. Timothy, all these people God used. Now watch very carefully. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, go down to verse number 26. For you see your calling, brethren, now these are people that are saved, how that not many wise men after the flesh. Now, we're supposed to be wise, but not, not like the world and the flesh would teach. Okay, you understand? That's why I said after the flesh. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. Huh. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God had chosen, God, see that? God had chosen, God had chosen. God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. There is your reason, verse 29. Do you read it? What does it say? that no flesh should glory in his presence. Amen. Well, yeah, if I was going to save somebody, I would save me. God said, no, that ain't going to happen. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, well, I'm really not that bad. And that's why God said to me, God said, no, that ain't going to happen. Uh -huh. God said, I on purpose choose that which cannot help itself, that which is not, doesn't have a lot of wisdom, even though the Bible said go after wisdom. I got all that. Don't outthink me now. Listen. And so what happens is God said, I know who you are. I know what you are. I know where you've been. I know your thoughts. I know what you think about yourself. And I know what you think about the person sitting across the aisle from you. And God said, I died for you. It's almost scary that God knows everything we've ever thought of, everything we've ever felt, every place we've ever been, everything we've ever looked at, and you know his assessment of us? You're a sinner. Come to me and I'll save you. And then I want you to work for me. I want you to live for me. Dude, let me get this right. You already know all this. And now you're inviting me to come to you and not just be saved, but then give my life and work for you? That is too good to be true. Now, for those of you who think he's getting a good deal, Sorry. Okay. Uh, well, you know, when, when I got saved, God, uh, yeah, well, you know, there wasn't that much to be forgiven of. And, you know, I kind of fit right in right off the bat. And, you know, yeah. wow. Can I, can I touch you? Yeah. Never touched a real holy person before. Do you know in verse number 26 through 29, do you know what that means? That means God wants and can Use you. God wants to. That's why he's calling you to himself this morning. This is why, this, look, hey, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. You fall asleep on your own. Go watch golf and fall asleep later on. That's why he's calling you to himself. That's why your flesh is saying, don't listen to oh, just a bunch of, just an old white guy talking all the time. What's he know? What's he know about life? I don't know anything about life, but I know someone who does. Amen. That's why he's calling you to himself even now. There are no perfect, pure, choice vessels God's looking for. That's right. Right. Amen. God makes those. Amen. He doesn't find them. Amen. He makes them. You understand that? Because God said when all is said and done, Pastor Bell, people will look at you and go, how in the world does he do this? Yeah. And I'll tell you, I don't know how in the world I do this. And God is saying, I know exactly how he's doing that. And I give God all the glory for that. You have to understand that. There is hope for all. Listen to me. Divorced one? I wish you weren't. God's not for it. But he doesn't hate you. He does not hate you. Unwed mother? Gang member? Now, when I start listening to this, you keep going, like, well, that's not me. That's not me. That's not me. Get, get, get the idea of the whole thing. Drunkard. Oh, I'm sorry. Sociable drinker. God calls folks like these all the time. Homosexual. Whoremonger. You know what a whoremonger is? You have whore and you have whoremonger. Those are Bible terms, by the way. A whore is a female. 
a whoremonger is a male. Yes, sir. Right. You understand? Liar, backslider. There's hope. Look at me. I'm not, you said, preacher, why did you point? I'm not mad at you. I'm not even upset at you. I'm trying to give you hope. God knows you're here. You're not here by accident. You're, you're not here going like, okay, we're invited to church. Let's go. Stop that. Who do you think I'm talking to? You. Yeah, knock it off. You're going to do it anyway, aren't you? Sit still. You got it? Go like this. I want to hear your brain rattle. Okay, you got it? Okay, good. Now, You're here by design. I know you find that hard to believe. I said, no, I'm not. Somebody invited me, and I thought, get them off my back. I'll go. I don't even like what's going on there, but I'll go. God knows you've been thinking that way. God knows you're sitting here right now, and even though you go, you shouldn't judge. You're judging me. Sure you are. Ever since you heard about me, you went online and started judging me. You never even met me yet. You start, yes, you did. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Now, so what happens here is simply this. God still calls. The backslider sitting in church, you're not fooling anybody. You live in sin all week long. You do what you want to all week long. And then come in here and when I begin to preach your halo choking the daylights out of you. And you wonder yourself, somebody's been talking to him about us. <laughs> no, not really. There are people sitting in churches more than we care to admit. Half of them are not saved. Half of them are so backslid, there's not a spiritual thing going on in your life anymore. We're so caught up in the world as long as we don't hurt any. You know, decades ago, uh, there was somebody that I knew that they were divorced. And so every summer, they shipped their kids to California to be with their biological dad. Oh, how many dads do you have? One. The one who is taking care of you. That's their biological dad. Then let him pay the bills. Let him watch over the kids. He said, oh, no, I wouldn't want him in here. Okay, then the guy who is there that's taking care of it, that's their dad. I had a guy walk into my office one time. Actually, he went to prison. Not after my office. I'm just saying that's, that's what happened. <laughs> and um, he was sitting there, and the guy who married his mother along with like six or eight kids took full responsibility for them all. And this big knucklehead sat in my office and said well he's really not my dad I don't have to mind him I stood up I was so mad I said don't you ever say that to me again that young man there married your mother after somebody walked off left her with all of those children to fend for himself he stepped up married her pays the bills watches over you don't you ever talk to me like that again he didn't you have to understand God loves and wants to use you. God wants you too, ma'am. You too. God will not accept what you are, but God will accept where you are. We've got to quit following the world's philosophy and its cool little jingles that it makes up. Well, why won't people just accept me for what I am? Because you're a sinner and not doing right. Why should I accept that? God will accept where you're at. God will save you in the middle of Egypt. But then he goes like this. Okay, get your shoes on. We've got to get out of here. You don't stay in Egypt once you get saved. There are a lot of Christians still living out in the world. They won't leave their old friends. They won't leave their old philosophies. They won't leave their old understandings. And therefore, they can't seem to make any headway. It's not God doesn't want to help you. You won't let Him. But God still wants to use you. God will not accept what you are, but where you are. I find it very difficult in my cranium, in that gray matter. Okay, it's called a brain. First of all, that God would save me. I know who and what I am. And it makes no sense to me why he would do that. The second thing that's almost as unbelievable, with all that going on, then he would say, I I want you to work for me. Excuse me? 
You know what I am. You know what I was. You know what I still fuss with. And you're asking me to work for you. That's unbelievable. God still has a plan for your life. Backslider, look up here. Hey, you that aren't in church half the time. Every couple of months, you miss for months on end. Uh, You get all involved with the Lord, and two weeks later, you're not involved with anything concerning God. I want you to understand something. God wants to use you. You're not letting Him. It's not that He doesn't want to. You're not letting Him. God can still get glory from your life if you will let Him. God still has people. He needs you to influence. Do you know there are people around you that only you know and meet? I'll never meet them. Whether you go to OSU, a lot of people down there need to be saved. Whether you go to a factory job, you go to an office job, I don't work there. Do you know why you're there? You had to make money. No. No, that's a side issue. Making money to help your family, that's a side issue. That's a side, look at me, that's a side issue. God puts you there to give you a job to pay your bills, help the local church. But even more important than that, there are people on that job that are going to die and go to hell or they think there's no future for them at all. And you are there, my dear friend, to tell them about Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. Open to your mouth and talk. Every Italian understands what I just said. If God is calling you to salvation or if God is calling you from your backslidden position into service, I know you'll probably feel guilty and unworthy. And I think you should. But God doesn't hold that against you if you'll come to him. Do you understand what a great opportunity this is that God will cleanse you and wants to use you again? If God could never use a person, it would have been me. Laura Mel just shook her head and went, boy, that's the truth. It would have been me. I am not trying to magnify my past life, not by a long shot. But have you ever considered, okay, you weren't like me at all, but you understand, being an unbeliever, not accepting God's only begotten son. You ready? Look at me. You, by not accepting Christ, are calling God a liar. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 12 through 14. Go ahead and read it. Not now. It's there. God said, if you do not believe the record that I gave my son, you're calling God a liar. So if you're not saved, number one, you're calling God a liar. Number two, you're saying, I heard the story about Jesus Christ. I don't believe it. Jesus said, I'm the door. No man comes to the Father but by me. So if you don't receive Jesus Christ as Savior, that's what's going to send you to hell. What's sending people to hell is not not being remarried or you're a homosexual. That's not what sends people to hell. What sends people to hell is not going through the door to heaven. You're guilty of not receiving God's Son. That's why you can't go to heaven. You can't go to heaven. There's only one. You're not getting a planet with 70 virgins. How can you believe that stuff? Even entertain the thought. You say, what's he talking about? Don't worry about it. If God was or could not call anybody, it would have been me. Here's what you think. You enter into my life after 51 years of being a Christian. And here's what you say to yourself. Preacher, man, if I could be like you, if I could have your kind of life, if I could be used of God like you, man, that'd be great. Really? Really? Before God saved me and worked on me for 51 years, I was rebellious. I'm just going to read you a whole list here real quick, okay? Vulgar, foul-mouthed, wicked, evil, violent. I'm not making this up. This was me. This is what I did. This was my character. Drug addict, dealer, drunkard, whoremonger. Liar, thief, deceiver, blasphemer, vile, selfish, unbeliever, on and on and on. Disobedient to parents, on, on and on. That was before I got saved. Let me tell you, after I got saved... After God working 51 years on my life, this is going to shock you. Listen to me carefully. I'm still rebellious at times. 
Still hateful towards some people at times. Faithless, often. Sin dominates my life at times. I know you're sure. No, 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 no. Do you really think you're that good, don't you? This, this is really coming as a shock to you. Because what, you're not? Eyes full of lust, carnal, selfish. Me. You know, the Bible talks about not letting sin reign. <coughs> have a position, have a right of way in your life. All Christians fuss with sin. Yes, sir. Sir. All that's in the world, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, is not of the Father. All of this is being used against you. You have, you have a nature that hates everything God. So you're always going to be fighting back and forth. So when you're fighting to not go along with something, when you're fighting to overcome something, God is saying, boy, way to go. Keep fighting. You're doing right. Yield to the Spirit. Don't give in to the flesh. You do that. However, we get into trouble when we start yielding and letting sin have a throne in our life. Reign. Have its right away. When you do that, when you start making excuse on what you're doing that's sinful is okay and not that bad, you are in big trouble. Because you're, you're not trying to yield to God anymore. You're yielding to your flesh. And God is going to have to chastise you and straighten you out. Please understand, God still calls me to himself. You know the thing that hurts me more than anything else is when I sin and do something wrong, he calls me like he still loves me. I'm not sure I could do that. But he does. I would get so tired of me messing up. I'd say, That's it. I'm done. I'm done. done. You'll, never, you'll never work out. Get out of here. But every time I do, you remember when Peter, uh, he said, before the night is over with, you're going to deny me three times. Y'all remember that? Yeah. Part of, okay. Do you remember what happened at the very end before he took off and ran away? He looked at Jesus and their eyes met. And it dawned on Peter what Jesus said. And he ran away and wept bitterly. That's the way I feel. When I feel I've let him down, that I've sinned, that I've given way, that I at times I don't care, I'm going to do this anyway. And then it seems like something happens and our eyes don't actually meet. But you know what I'm saying. I can't believe he would love me. I, I, my mom, uh, one day I came home and my life was a mess before I got saved. And, I, you know, I've gone through the beatings and the, and the paddlings and the, and the light cords and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I went through all that. And honestly, I kind of got used to that. And you're just not going to do it anymore. The time I was 14, 15 years old, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not taking a spanking or a beating anymore. I'm just done with it. My mom came in one night and sat on the edge of my bed. My mom wasn't even a Christian. And she said this. Now, she used God against me. But she said, do you think God would be pleased with the way you're living? I'd rather have taken a beating. Man, that stuck in my heart. And I, I, I almost cried and I, I stiffened up and I just stared. God's trying to call you to him. So why do you keep resisting? Amen. You think, what, he's going to hurt you? He, he's going to take everything that's good away from you? What do do you think he's going to do? You're not listening to him. He wants to use you, which is very, very hard to understand. All of these things going on in life. Salvation does not make you perfect. Salvation forgives your your sins. That's all that it does. Now that I'm saved, God said, okay, here's how I want you to live. He didn't say, I saved you. Now go try to live good. No, he said, I saved you. This is the way I want to use you. And this is the way I want. So this is what we say. Oh, the Bible is full of do's and don'ts. Well, no kidding. What do you think it was full of? Okie dokies? God is saying, this is what I want now that you belong to me. I want you to do this and I don't want you to do that. So this is what God's trying to do. Now that you're saved, God has a plan. Do you understand? God has a plan. God has a plan. And the plan isn't to run through this life just doing the best you can. God has a plan for the person that he saved and forgave of their sin and now says, obey me, I'll bless your life and I will use you. Who would have ever thought that God Almighty, knowing everything you've ever done, thought about, even intended to do, God said, I know all of that, come to me. Pretty good. Philippians chapter number 3. Go there real quick. Philippians chapter number 3. After 2 Corinthians, Galatians, 
Ephesians, Philippians, chapter number 3. We are under, I think, maybe I'm wrong about this, under the impression, I think you should sin less, but you're not sinless, even after you're saved. The more you learn and the more you learn to walk with God, you should sin a whole lot less, but you're not sinless. You'll never be that till you get to heaven. Your very body is against you living for God. Do you understand? Look in Philippians chapter 3, verse number 12. Here's the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul saved and given his life to the Lord, and watch what he says. Not as though I had already attained. Either were already... Per- We're talking about the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul wrote three quarters of the New Testament. I mean, here's a man, as if you would, one born out of due time, who got saved on the road to Damascus and, and called Jesus Lord, gave his life to him, turned his whole life around... I mean, gave away everything to the salvation of others and the cause of Christ. And he says this, not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended. Can I ask you something? You saved. Why? Why did God save you and leave you here? Hey. Pay attention to me. Why did God save you and leave you here? Paul said, that's a great question. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stay at it until I actually apprehend the reason Jesus apprehended me. You ever wonder why you and not somebody else in your family? You ever wonder why your best friend? You ever wonder why the guy next door to you and not you? you? Do you not wonder about stuff? I do. I wonder about that and thought, okay, why me? And my sister, no, she had to go home. She wasn't feeling well. Why me out of my family? Don't do this. Uh, Don't do that. God has a purpose. God has a reason for you to be there. And so Paul said, you know something? I'm going to keep following until I apprehend. See that? But I follow after. For which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. I am going to apprehend. He, He apprehended me for a reason. He left me here to do something. I bless God, I'm going to stay at it until I find out exactly what that's all about. God did not give up on you. You gave up on Him. I don't care what your age is. I don't care what, how young you are, how old you are. If you're a born-again Christian, God has never given up on a child. Never. Now, God does not give in. He does not give up, which is a lesson for parents, too. He said, but pastor, I've done some awful horrible things since I've been saved. What should I do? A couple of things and we're done. Ready? What should I do? Run to the house of God. Have you ever, has ever, have you ever wondered why it becomes so difficult just to show up to church? Everything. If you're going to play Little League, guess, guess what day they play on? Little League football. Sunday. Soccer? Sunday. Baseball, Sunday. Picnics, Sunday. Family get-togethers, Sunday. I'm sorry, is Sunday, is it, right on, is it our day or the Lord's day? Yeah. It's the Lord's day. Yeah. But the world has taught us to read it. But it's my only day off. So let me get this right. The world took every day and says, Sunday's your day to do whatever you're going to do. How mean of God to save you, to do all this for you, and then expect you to go to his house. And that, oh, that's just unfair. I just don't get that at all. No. I'm kidding. Okay, you didn't think I was serious, right? First of all, run to church. When you sit in church, no matter what you're caught up in out in the world, if you will, wake yourself up. Amen. Revelation said, he that hath ears, let him hear. Well, everybody has ears. Some people are just not listening. I would imagine maybe even some in here this morning. You're staring at me and you're doing this. But you're in Maui somewhere. Caribbean something, right? Things get clearer. When you hear God's word being preached, the God's Bible is so true and obvious. The more you hear it, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You keep going like this. Yeah, that's true. 
yeah, I wondered about that. Well, that's the reason. But you'd have missed all that if you weren't in church. The world is too overwhelming. That's why God said, come out from among them. You're no match for the world. Don't care what your education is. Don't care what your talent is. Don't care what your age is. You cannot take on the world. You cannot do it. So God has a plan for us to be in church together. Why do most run from church instead of to church? Okay, ready? You're not going to be back tonight, right? I want you to write down right now on a piece of paper. Why not? I'll help you out. I got to get up early in the morning. Here's one. My kids have got school tomorrow. Okay, then I want them in bed by 8. Yeah, look at them like, huh? Ain't no way in the world. I ain't going to bed by 8 o'clock. Every excuse you could want will come your way on why I don't have to obey God. Obey God. It's not just a Baptist thing because a lot of Baptists aren't doing this anymore. Number two, run to the altar. A long time ago, people used to say, keep short accounts with God. You know what that means? Of course, in a day when you spend everything to the hilt, uh, every credit card you got, you may not understand that, that philosophy. Keep short accounts, okay? Something goes wrong and is applied to your bill. Bring to the Lord and tell Him all about it. And don't just do this. God, forgive me of everything. That's like people, charismatic people. God, kick the devil out of the world. It ain't going to happen. And I can prove it. It's not happening. Be more specific. What have you been doing? Lusting? Living in adultery? Tell God. Well, I've been kind of doing wrong. You've been kind of doing wrong. You're living in sin. You're living in... Hey, set up, pay attention to me. You're living in sin. Folks, listen to me, please. We've got to the place where we think church is a place that we enjoy and it's entertaining. If you can't enjoy the Word of God that keeps you straight and close to God, I, I, look, you might as well go somewhere. I can't help you. But church has turned into entertainment. Swaying to Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought the Beatles said that. Whatever. Do not let sin mount up in your life. It will bury you. It will bury you with guilt and shame and embarrassment. And pretty soon you don't want to show up here. Where are all these people that we won to Christ? Where are all your family members that said, I got saved? Where are all your friends that came here, heard Amen. the word of God, said they got saved? Where are they? This is what happened to them. Amen. Amen. And they don't think God will forgive me. What's the use of trying? I can't do this anymore. You need to come to the altar and meet with God. You need to repent. Repent means a change of your mind. Quit defending yourself. Quit giving God an excuse. God's not looking for an excuse. He's right. looking for honesty. Amen. Amen. He already knows everything. What do you, you ever notice you, you talk to some people, especially teenagers and children, what do you do? You can almost see them. Um, um, they're looking for a they, i got to make something up right now. i, I got to come up with a story. I gotta, why don't you, my mom and my dad, when he was home, go like, don't you lie to me. Just tell me the truth or it's going to be a lot worse. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. Okay, your parents never did that? And I'd say, okay, you're not kidding me. If I tell you the truth, you're killing me. When they found out that I lied, you won't believe it. I died 16 times. Seriously. God wants to forgive you. Number three, run to the man of God. And I know this is something that's been attacked for a long time by bad example, by false doctrine, by all kinds of things. Run to the man of God, not to a man of God, your man of God. You belong to the Anchor Baptist Church. I'm your pastor. Amen. Good, bad, or indifferent. Sorry, that's the way it is. God designed it that way. Right. You said, preacher, I, I, I know what's wrong. I, I don't need to come and talk to somebody about it. I, I don't need to talk with you. I know what I should do. Then why haven't you done it yet? Right. Why haven't you done it yet? Amen. You know, the easiest place to get right with God would be inside church where people are praying for you, Amen. preachers preaching to you. God wants you to be saved. You even now feel him kind of tugging on you going, you know, that's right. Come on. Amen. And then you, somehow you're going to go home with all the interference and the TV's on, the wrong music's on, and your friend's knocking on the door, and, and the dog's eating the cat and whatever the case is, which is proper, by the way. And you find all these things going on, and yet you haven't gotten right yet. God put a human leader in every Christian's life for a reason. You say, I follow God. You're not biblical. 
You're not biblical. Why don't your kids go like this? I don't need a mom and dad. I follow God. Now, you think that's ridiculous. But when it comes to someone who is an adult leader in your life, you know the Bible, and I don't want to get in all that. I'm God's man for you. I'm not disappointed in you. I'm pulling for you. I want God's blessings in your life. I want you to be used, not just you, but greatly of God. I'm not just trying to get everything from you. I'm trying to give everything God wants you to have to you. Well, he wants all of this and he wants all of that. Why? What am I going to do with it? Good night. I'll be 72 years old. What am I going to do? I may not tell you what you want to hear, but I'll tell you what you need to hear. I'm trying to do that this morning. Are you listening? In Hebrews 13, 17, real quick, I have two minutes. No, I don't. I have as long as I want. Anyway. Hebrews chapter 13, look at verse 17. Now, you'll not like this first word right off the bat, but there's a lot of words modern people do not like in the Bible anymore, like submit, servant. Here's another word you don't like, you're not real fond of, verse number 13. I'm sorry, chapter 13, verse number 17. Obey, oh, don't like that one. I don't like obey. I don't like that one. Ready? Obey them, certain people that have the rule over, I don't like that rule over me stuff. Nope, ain't going along with that. I'm not obeying and nobody rules over me. Yeah, including God, right? And submit yourself. It's something you have to willingly do. But why would you do that? For they watch for your souls. As they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. When I become grieved and I struggle with you and I try to help you out and I say, no, don't do that. You do it anyway. And then you don't show up. I tell you, no, here's what you need to do and you don't. That's really tough. It's tough. Now you're going about your life. But I kind of take that with me. And all I want you to do is, you know, if you do, you say, how do you know it'll work? Well, first of all, it's in God's word. Number two, I've proven it in my own life. And a lot of other people have too. There are no exceptions to God's rules. Watch for your souls. And then finally, run to the work for God. For God. Proverbs 16, 13. Commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. That's simple. If I commit myself to the work of God, all of a sudden things begin to figure. That makes sense. Now I know why. What's he say? Commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. Get involved doing something. You're, you don't come to church to visit. This is your family. If you're a born again Christian, this is your family. Amen. 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 I like coming here. Amen. I enjoy church. Of all the problems that we have, we have had a ton of them. I'd rather be at the Anchor Baptist Church than any place I know of. I spend, I know you're not a preacher. I understand all that. I probably spend 80% of my life, if not more, right here at this church. I don't have to. I get to. I don't have to hang around you people. I get to hang around you people. I don't have to straighten you out. I get to straighten out. And uh, <clears throat> do you understand? Why, why, you got saved and God, used you, you don't seem very happy about it. On, no. You know, he's the savior, not the enslaver. Right. You understand that? Yeah. He doesn't enslave yeah. people. He saves people Amen. and then wants to use people. He said, preacher, God can't use somebody like me. Absolutely not true. Now, if you think you're too good and you can't understand why God <laughs> needs to save you, yeah, God can't use you. Because you'd brag about it. Well, I've got this to offer to God, and I've got that to offer to God. God wants to do everything for you and through you. God does not need your gifts and your talents. God can give those to anybody else, but I will tell you something he does want. A willingness 
to serve him. He'll take care of everything else. Can I ask you something? Are you saved? I mean, sinfully. Not, not I understand salvation. I didn't ask intelligently. Do you understand? Do you know Jesus? Yes. Was he born of a, mirror, of a virgin? Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and, yeah. Around Christmas time or something. I don't get all that. But, and and you, you start telling me facts. I didn't ask you if you factually knew Jesus. Right. I want to know from your heart, do you know Jesus? Do you know who he is? Does he belong to you now too? If that's the case, why don't we start living like I owe him everything? What are you holding back for? Why do we not just run to him and say, Jesus, I've sinned. You told me to come to you and you'd forgive me. Okay, come to him and let him forgive you. You try to cover it up, smooth it over, present it to him as not being that bad. He was there when you did it. He was there when you said it. He was there when you looked at it. He was there. He understands even the, te- the intention. Right. Whether you really meant to or you didn't mean to, he was there. He knows it all. Right. And he's just waiting to see how truthful you'll be with him. If you'll humble yourself down, say, Jesus, you saved me. I belong to you. Please forgive me. Help me not to do that again. That's honest, isn't it? But when you say, I don't need to, you're in real trouble. Are you saved? You know whether you are. As soon as I ask that question, you start asking yourself, don't do that. Well, I think I am. I go to church. I don't do this. I'm good to my neighbor. I'm sorry. That's not salvation. You should be good to your neighbor. But that has nothing to do with salvation. Are you saved? If you're not, answer this. Why did Jesus have to die for you? You don't need to be saved. You're good enough, right? Then answer the question. What shall we do with this man which is called Christ? What are you going to do about that? One of these days you'll have to answer for that. Let's bow our heads and word of prayer, please.